Welcome to CollisionConf Day 3. Hello, Twitch. We have Kunal Batra, my friend and colleague, who's going to be giving you the introductory talk. This is where you get started. This is where you get the overview. It's going to be very exciting. So, Kunal, take it away. Thanks, Rob. Morning, everyone. Uh, this is, as Rob mentioned, the introductory talk for AWS. My name is Kanal Batra. I'm a senior technical evangelist at Amazon Web Services. Uh, just a little bit about me before we begin. You can see my photo there on the right of the screen. Uh, my Twitter handle is right underneath that, Kanal732. If you have any questions at any time after this presentation, that is the best way to reach me, even faster than email. So feel free to tweet at me, follow me over there. Um, a little bit more, uh, I love working with developer-focused products. I've been at a lot of developer-focused companies. So if you, have any, uh, you want to have any discussions on any of the other companies over here, feel free to reach out. Happy to chat about anything else, too. Um, and then also, I'm really into machine learning and computer vision. Um, we're going to touch a little bit about that today, but I'll have another talk around 4 p.m. We're actually creating a, an image classification model if you guys are interested in attending that. It's actually going to be the last session on the last day, so please come. <laughs> uh, and also, um, I was about to cancel my HBO subscription after uh, the Game of Thrones aired. And then I saw last night the season three um, of Westworld, the trailer, and it looks amazing. So I uh, tell you, uh, wait before, uh, first watch the trailer before you make a decision. All right, so let's get started, guys. Um, first, before we begin, I just want to talk about what is cloud computing before we get into uh, AWS and all of the services. And so the way I look at it is cloud computing is the on-demand delivery of IT resources via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. That photo that you're seeing right now on the slide to the right was actually one of the first companies I worked at uh, over 10 years ago. Um, and back then, uh, we had to wait at least three to four weeks before we can get a server to work on uh, anytime there was a new project. And at the time, I thought it was really fast. I thought that was pretty quick to provision a new machine. Um, that's no longer the way the world works now, right? So you no longer have to, uh, with the cloud, you no longer have to maintain and own your own data centers and servers. And I just want to go a little bit into why cloud computing. What are the benefits that happen with the cloud? And so. You guys might know this already, but there are a lot of great benefits with the cloud. The first is agility. With AWS and clouds in general, you have the ability to spin up now hundreds to even thousands of servers within minutes. No longer do you have to wait three to four weeks for the old days of getting a machine and starting to work with it. You also have great cost savings that come with this because you only pay for what you use. And this is uh, based on the service you're using by the second or millisecond. And so those capital uh, expenditures for those machines now turn into variable expenses. And now those variable expenses are actually less uh, cheaper than what most companies can do for themselves due to AWS's economies of scale. Next is elasticity. With AWS, you, can, um, you can no longer have to provision machines for peak business level activity. You now you can only provision uh, machines for what you need when you need it. And faster innovation. Uh, with AWS or cloud in general, you no longer have to worry about that undifferentiated heavy uh, lifting when it comes to managing infrastructure. Let us take care of that. You guys can take care of uh, whatever you're focusing on right now in your organizations. And finally, the last major benefit of the cloud is global presence. Really quickly, with the click of a button, you can deploy applications throughout the world. And with AWS, that's 21 different geographic regions, over 66 different availability zones. And we'll touch on what that means. So overall, with AWS, you have a lot of benefits, especially being quick to provision, combined with a lot of features that we're going to talk about today in this presentation. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And now. We're going to go to this slide over here. The first time I saw this slide, I thought it looked like the periodic table of elements. Um, but it, it's actually not even all of our services. It is a, uh, categories of our services that don't e actually touch everything we have. So what I'm going to do here um, for the next portion of this presentation is go over uh, 
pieces, uh, certain services over here, not all of them. And then after this, we're going to walk through a couple of demos, because that's the fun part, actually seeing this in action. So let's get started here with basically what's underlying most of AWS, and that's our infrastructure. We have what I mentioned before, regions, uh, 21 different regions across the world. We have 66 availability zones. And you might be wondering, what's a region? What's an availability zone? Um, whenever we mention the word availability zone, these are actually data centers. A availability zone is made up of one or more data centers that are connected together. And these are actually where those services happen, where the compute, storage, databases, uh, and other services actually get happen in these availability zones. Now, in regions, these availability zones are connected. They're connected with a low latency fiber optic connection, and they have separate uh, redundant power and networking. So it's definitely high availability. And all of these regions, the 21 different regions, are isolated. So if one region goes down or there's an issue, there's not, it's not going to happen to any of the other regions. Um, and then when you look at the core services over here, we have a bunch of great core services. So we have Compute, which I'm guessing a lot. Has anyone here used Compute for AWS? Nice. Well, with, for those who haven't, Compute, uh, we have tons of EC2 virtual machines that you can allocate with uh, EC2, and they're optimized for different types of workloads. So you can have machines that have high amounts of RAM. You can have machines that are dedicated, have GPUs for machine learning applications if you want to build those. You can also have um, really crazy uh, Z1D instances that have four gigahertz core processors, just in case you have a really high performance compute workload. And again, you can provision those within minutes. Um, really fast, and then you can also scale them down, and you only pay for what you use. Uh, and then we also have instances that go from just bare metal. So it's no, it's, these are not virtualized. These are actual machines with no virtualization. Uh, on top of that, we have other core services here that are really um, the baseline of AWS. For storage, we have something called S3. S3 was one of the first services we launched a while ago. It actually stands for Simple Storage Service. Um, it, basically, you can put any object into S3 and then get that back really quickly. Uh, we also have different tiers for that, too. Uh, we named it Glacier and Glacier Deep Archive based on if you want to save money and you want to store data, but you don't need it right away. You can uh, wait uh, 30 days or a couple of weeks before you want to access that data again. Um, it really makes the price a lot cheaper for using uh, storage. Um, and then we have pretty much every database possible, whether it's relational, non-relational, graph databases, um, what do you want, some sort of cache layer with Redis, uh, anything you can think of for, that you need for your application, that's available with uh, our database uh, services. So I'm going to move on to the next one over here. Now, security and compliance is something that we, it's a really big priority here at AWS for us. We invest a lot of time and money to innovate and build on this space. And we have a lot of compliances and certifications that we're a part of. So we have HIPAA for healthcare, PCI DSS for payments, uh, DOD security requirements for uh, military and government contractors. Um, we meet uh, the FedRAMP moderate and high business um, uh, baselines for regulated workloads for government. So there's a lot of security compliances that we follow. Um, but when we look at security AWS, it's not just network security. We have something called a shared responsibility model, which means that AWS, we protect the cloud, and then we rely on our users, you guys, to protect what's in the cloud, your applications. So we will provide network security, we'll provide um, physical data center security, which is a lot of heavy lifting, and then we look at you to make sure that the applications that you build are secure as well. And if you leave a port open or something goes wrong, um, we expect you guys to also fix that. So that's our security model over here. Um, and also, one of the other things I want to mention is that anytime we work with a large company and we innovate on behalf of them, all of our customers get the benefits of that. Any big bank or financial institution that has really complex uh, security requirements, we will make sure to meet those and then all of our customers also get those benefits too, which is really awesome. Now, two of my favorite categories here are IoT and machine learning. 
Uh, let's talk a little bit about the IoT category and what it do we do at AWS with there. So there are billions of devices in homes, factories, oil wells, hospitals, cars, and thousands of other places. Our solutions with IoT uh, let you connect those devices, collect, store, and analyze that device data. But it's so much more than just uh, physical things. You can also build, um, take advantage of WebSockets into your web applications, or you can build real-time gateways for your mobile uh, apps as well. So even though it says IoT, it's way more than just IoT. And now my personal uh, favorite category here is machine learning. I'm going to go ahead and just showcase this into, uh, I think, a slide that uh, details this a little better. We look at machine learning here at AWS into three different layers. That bottom layer is for experts. These are the frameworks and infrastructure that data scientists can use to create and deploy their models. That middle uh, tier over there is for our service SageMaker. Uh, has anyone here heard of SageMaker? Nice. Um, so for those who haven't, SageMaker is our fully managed machine learning service. It lets you label data from going there. You can now go ahead and train your models. Then you can go and tune those models and then deploy those models and scale that with AWS all through SageMaker. Uh, it's pretty cool. And one of the applications I'll building at 4 PM actually walks you through that SageMaker process if you guys want to check or stay around for that. And now that top level service now, those AI services on that top layer, these are not meant for um, anyone who has machine learning or a data science background. These are just for developers, where you get to take advantage of models that have been trained internally by data scientists at AWS. Um, on the top left on that slide over there, you can see uh, there's, we have a couple of vision models. So we have a service called AWS Recognition that gives you the ability to do a couple of really cool things. You can do image classification, so you can see what's in an image. And this is great for if you have any sort of workloads that require moderation, if you want to see something safe for work, not safe for work, uh, if you want to go ahead and organize a bunch of images. Uh, recognition really lets you do that. It also gives you detection where it tells you not only what's in an image, where it is in an image, which is great for counting objects uh, or inventory uh, is what we see a lot over here. The other two services that I'm sure people here are familiar with are Amazon Transcribe and Amazon Poly. So this is speech to text and text to speech APIs that developers use quite a bit. Um, and that's really how we think of uh, ML in those three layers over there. Nice. So some other services here uh, that I really like and I wanted to point out was Elasticsearch. Uh, Anyone here familiar with Elasticsearch in general? Nice. Um, also, for those who are familiar with Elasticsearch, I also recommend checking out our open distro for Elasticsearch as well. It's really cool. It's an open source version of Elasticsearch, too. Um, so with Elasticsearch, for those who don't know what it is, it's a great way to ingest lots of machine-generated data, specifically logs, and search through that. Um, it's also great for a full text search as well. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. Um, and then something that we have here that's really fun is our data migration service. So literally with our data migration service, if you have a lot of data in your organization and you want to put that into the AWS cloud, we have a service called Snowmobile that will take a semi-truck trailer, go to your organization, and then from there load it up. And it can handle up to 100 petabytes of data and then bring that to an AWS uh, availability zone. So literally, it is probably the biggest um, USB drive in the world. Um, we have another couple of services here. Uh, Amazon Redshift for data warehousing. If you have a lot of data into your, in your applications and your organizations and you want to make sense of that, Redshift is a great way to scan through that. And I know these are a lot of services here, but I just wanted to give a little flavor of some of the ones I really like. And uh, if you want to play around more, feel free to ask questions or um, check it out. Now, my favorite part of this is going to be the demo. So we, we, we went through a whole bunch of services, a lot of names. I don't know if everyone's going to remember it, but I'm going to give you some resources afterwards where you can learn more. Um, but now. Let's get our hands dirty and start doing some demos. 
So the first demo I want to showcase, which is something that I think will be pretty relatable for everyone over here, is building a website. That's one of the simplest things that you think about when um, using the cloud. And so what I thought would be fun to do was showcase how to do it, make it simpler, make it simpler, and have three fun demos for you guys to see on how to build a website. So the first thing I'm going to do is go to my browser. Uh, I'm already logged in to AWS, but for those who don't have it, it's console.aws, console.aws.amazon.com. If you're not logged in, it'll give you the login screen right there as well. And this is where you can see everything happening on AWS. You can see all the different services. On the top over here, you also have the ability to pin services that you use quite often. So you can click on the pin, and you can drag and drop a service that you use quite often up to the bar. Um, I personally just like searching for services. So for the first service that I'm going to do right now is LightSail. And we're going to showcase how to allocate a virtual machine to LightSail and then convert that into a web server. So I'm going to go ahead and create an instance. Now, when we create an instance, we have to choose which operating system. For this one, I'm going to say uh, Linux. From here, we choose a blueprint. I don't want apps. I just want the operating system only. So click on that. And then we'll choose Ubuntu as the operating system. I'm just going to choose the middle layer right now in terms of instance plans. And we're going to call this Collision Demo as the name of the machine. Now we're going to go ahead and create this instance. Now this does take a minute or two to create. But one of the first things you can see is right away we can see what type of specifications of hardware come with our instance right underneath the name. So you, I don't know if everyone can see that over there in that screen. It's kind of small. Let me make this bigger. Uh, you can see it comes two gigs of RAM, one virtual CPU, a 60 gig hard drive. You can also see the IP address that this machine was allocated with right over here on top of the location. So while it's loading, I'm just going to go ahead and click on another instance that I've already done. And we'll go back to that one. So as soon as you click on an instance that you just allocated, you get to see a bunch of information right over here. Again, you can see the IP address. You can see the status of the machine. You can uh, connect to it to SSH, which we're going to do shortly. Um, you can also see the storage metrics and how the machine's doing and uh, the history of what we've done with that machine. So let me go back and see if that initial machine that we just tried to spin up is working. Yes, it is. Collision demo. It's no longer grayed out. It's in color. And now we're going to connect to this machine with SSH to build our website. So we're going to go ahead, connect to SSH. We're connecting to our instance right now. From here, we can see our machine. I'm just going to go ahead and run this in pseudo mode. Now, we're going to do something. Um, we want to convert this machine into a web server. And one of the quickest ways to do that is with Docker. And we're going to go ahead and get a doc install Docker on this machine, get a Docker container for Nginx, which is a web server, and then just showcase how quick it is to build a website. So the first thing we're going to do over here is install that Docker uh, program. So we're going to go to uh, get.docker.com and then uh, install that script. Uh, no such file. Let me try again. Oh, I see what I did wrong. It's HTTPS. And if you're not familiar with Docker, that's OK. It's just a, it's a way for us to get containerized applications and run that really quickly. Um, it's just a way to showcase how easy it is to add a web server onto our app over here. So now it's installing Docker. Right after it's done installing it, I'm going to go ahead and just make sure that everything is working properly in a second or two. And then right after it is working properly, I'm going to go ahead and, well, let's just strike it right now. Docker run hello world. Perfect, it's working. Next thing we're going to do is get Nginx, which is a web server. So I'm going to go ahead and get the Nginx container. 
Internet's going fast, which is great. Now we have Nginx on our machine. From here, I'm going to go ahead and run uh, Nginx. So I'm going to say Docker run. Uh, and now we're going to just map port 80 onto our machine to port 80 onto our Nginx container. And then run this. So it looks like it might be running. Now we're going to go ahead and get this public IP here and put it in our browser. Whoops. And we can see it works. So you see the default page for Nginx, which is the web server. Um, so pretty much in a couple of minutes, we allocated a virtual machine. We uh, installed Docker on there. We ran the Docker container uh, for Nginx. We have a web server on there. And now we see the default page for Nginx, um, which is great. Now, let me do one more thing. Uh, the default page is OK, but let's do a static. Let's do a custom page for this just to show you how it's done. So let me go back to our SSH shell. And now let's make a new directory. We're going to call it root www. And then from there, we're going to um, just make a new index.html uh, file. So I'm just going to open up my favorite editor. Um, from here, let's just make a quick HTML file. I'm just going to uh, put a header tag here and then say, hello, audience. I hope this works, exclamation. And then from here, I'm just going to go ahead and save this. So now we have this index.html file um, in our directory. Now I'm going to just go ahead and run Docker again. Docker run. Uh, we're going to go ahead and bind this directory into our Docker container. And so user share uh, engine x HTML. And this is that path over there is just the path that Nginx looks at when it wants to run an HTML uh, where it picks up its HTML files. Um, and then over here, we're going to go ahead and just map this again to port 80 um, from our server to our Docker container, and then say engine x. Looks like it's going. Let's see if this works. Oh, no. Let's see what I did wrong. Here, let me try this again. Let me try this in detached mode. And then let me just make sure I have a little cheat sheet here to make sure I got the right user share nginx HTML. Yeah, it looks right. Let's see what happens if I try it again. Docker run sv ww user share engine x html d minus p mapping this to port 80 to port 80 on the server engine x okay let me see if it's running in the background looks like it is let's hope it works now whoops oh no all right so so what's that is it not there if it's not, let's see what the issue is. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's make that file. So the problem was the index.html file was in that directory. So let's go ahead and create that again. H1. Hello, audience. Let's hope this works now. OK. Let's go ahead and run this then. All right, so let's see if that made a difference. Thank you, sir. Um, so now we uh, created, uh, allocated a virtual machine, ran a Docker, have Nginx running on it, and we have a custom static site on it. So that was cool. Um, but now let's do this again and not have to worry about that virtual machine. Let's not have to worry about that infrastructure. And to do that, we can take advantage of another service we have at AWS, which is called Lambda. Is anyone here familiar with the serverless framework as serverless? Awesome. So the way this works, we're going to go ahead and create a Lambda function, which is basically just putting code in the cloud. 
And there are several ways where now you can invoke this code. Uh, for us, we're just going to do one way, which is the API gateway, so we could run this function through our browser. So I'm going to go ahead and create a function. I'm going to say author from scratch. Function name, we're going to put, uh, what is it? Collision demo uh, 2019. Let me just copy that. And then we're going to hit create function, leave everything else defaults. So now it's creating that function in the background. As soon as that's done, we're going to load up onto this uh, Lambda screen for our function. I'm going to go ahead here and see the code in our Lambda function. I'm going to gut that. And I'm just going to say return um, hello, everyone. Save this. Now, when we save this, you can see over here the Amazon resource name. This resource name identifies our function. However, we can't execute this function right now. So we need a way to invoke this Lambda function. Otherwise, it's just by itself isolated. And to do that, we're going to take advantage of another service called API Gateway. So did I miss something? Oh, thank you, sir. Good eye. Save this. All right. We're going to go ahead and go to API Gateway. So I'm going to open up another tab. Go to console.aws.amazon.com. And now I'm going to launch the API Gateway service. API Gateway, now we're going to go ahead and create an API. And we want the same thing to happen again. We want to go into our browser with the URL, and we want to now invoke that function to see that text that we just put in there. So for this name, I'm just going to call the API name Collision uh, Demo. And then uh, leave it as that. Say Create API. And over here, we now have the same actions that we get with any sort of HTTP site, which is CRUD, um, create, read, update, delete. And what we're going to want to do right now is create a get method, which is what our browser calls when it um, makes a request. So let's go ahead and create a get method over here. And now, when we go to our URL, we want it to invoke a Lambda function, the Lambda function we just created. So that's the integration that's going to happen with the Lambda function. We're just going to give the function name, which is Collision Demo 2019. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you over here was it automatically auto populates the function, so you don't need to memorize that. So put Collision Demo 2019. We're going to go ahead and save. And now you can see this screen pop up where it's asking us uh, that we're telling us we're about to give permission to that Amazon resource name so it can be invoked um, by this API gateway. Um, and that's important because otherwise, if we didn't do this, this function would be isolated. There would be no way to access it. So it's important to know what other uh, services have permissions to access func these functions. So I'm going to say OK. And now we get this interesting diagram. You can see this flow describing what's going to happen with our API gateway function. The client in this case is going to be our browser. We're going to go in our browser. We're going to type in the URL that it gives us whenever we deploy the API gateway method. Then it's telling us from here that it's going to pass on the request to the Lambda function that we gave it. Now, the Lambda function over here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, um, but now the Lambda function over here that we gave it is then going to return back uh, a response. And then that's going to go ahead and pass that on to another method over here that adds also an HTTP status 200 OK and sends that back to our client, in which case is going to be the browser. So let's go ahead and deploy this API. And we don't have a name yet, so I'm going to give it a new name. I'm going to call it um, prod, and then say deploy. And now you can see that we've created it. We finally have a URL that we can use to call. And now we see hello, everyone, right when we enter that URL. So we didn't have to allocate any virtual machines, worry about the brow the what server is running this. Um, this is basically code in the cloud. And from here, we just connected it to an API gateway to invoke that uh, code. So this is cool. 
I still feel like there's a lot of heavy lifting going on. How do we make this even simpler? So for this last demo uh, that I have for you right now, I'm going to use one of my favorite uh, serverless frameworks, which is called AWS Chalice. So let me go over here. This is my terminal. Can everyone see that? Let me make it a little bigger. There we go. Um, so this is my terminal. And now we're going to take advantage of a serverless framework called Chalice. I don't know if anyone here does Python development and familiar with Flask, but it's literally Flask for serverless. Uh, and it comes with a lot of uh, great uh, components here, which you'll see in a second. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, cr create a virtual environment, like any Python developer. We're going to call this virtual environment um, collision. So we create this virtual environment. The virtual environment now is just making sure that everything we now work in is isolated from any other dependencies that have in my system. And now we're going to go ahead and uh, work in, uh, start up this environment, initialize it. So we're going to say source collision bin activate. Uh, there we go, activate. And now we're working in my virtual environment. Now to get started, we need to set up chal uh, Chalice. So we're going to say pip install Chalice, which is our serverless framework. So we're setting up Chalice right now. As soon as it's done, I'm just going to run Chalice without any other parameters so you can see what commands it comes with. Yep, you can see that. Uh, so the a command we're going to use right now is called new project. Because we're starting something from scratch, I'm going to say Chalice new project and call this C demo. So now, as soon as I said Chalice new project, it created a folder for us uh, for our project name. So I'm going to go in there. And you can see there are two files right now, app.py, which is our Python file that has the code we need to run, and then requirements.txt, which has any dependencies that we might need to add in our application. So right now, we're not going to have any dependencies. I'm just going to go ahead and modify our app.py. And so on the right over here, you can see where my cursor is. This is all the code that we need to modify, right? I'm not going to touch anything else. I'm just going to say, instead of return uh, this JSON object, hello world, I'm just going to say, uh, let me get rid of that. And I'm going to say, return hello audience. And that's it. That's the only change I'm going to make there. That's all the code I'm going to add. I'm going to go ahead and save this. And now I'm just going to say chalice deploy. Now, when I'm doing Chalice Deploy, everything you saw me do before in the console of creating the API gateway, and then from there connecting the API gateway and integrating it with the Lambda function, all that's happening for us right now. Everything's happening in the back end. And right, up, right away, we get this URL that we can automatically click on and run our Lambda function. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this URL. It's going to open up another tab. And I know it's really small and really bright, apparently. Um, but it says, hello, audience. So you can see um, this progression of there are multiple ways to go ahead and build your website. You can allocate a virtual machine through LightSail. From there, you can go ahead and set up your own uh, web server interface with a Docker or whatever else you want. Uh, you can also take advantage of Lambda. Um, and you can do that with the console. Or you can even make your life easier and take advantage of a serverless framework like Chalice, which is great. And I use that uh, extensively. So th that's the demos. I know people here must have questions on uh, where to get started and other resources. So I just want to go ahead and go to our, let me make this full screen now. Definitely take, use your phones, take photos of this. If you want information on more resources as soon as it loads up. Uh, Take advantage of the AWS blog. It's got a ton of great articles and tutorials on getting started with all aspects of AWS services. Give everyone a shot there to take a photo. 
it's constantly updated as well. Um, awesome. And then I definitely recommend following these Twitter accounts as well. Uh, you'll get, get a lot of great information on services that are just launched and what it can do for you and your organizations. You can also go ahead and check out the GitHub uh, repos over there, AWS, AWS Labs, and uh, AWS Samples, to find out information on different tutorials if you want to get started, which is what I love to do. Finally, a lot of these events are being uh, streamed on Twitch, and you can see a lot of videos on there already to take advantage of. So if you want to look at other talks happening on different Twitch services, feel free to check uh, twitch.tv-aws. Uh, and has anyone here been to reInvent in the past? I definitely recommend checking out reInvent. It is uh, a mecca uh, for people who are technical and want to learn more about AWS, have different types of workloads, very varied. Um, it is an amazing event. I really recommend going there. Um, and just for our future talks that we're going to have later today, we, at 11 a.m., you can see, uh, starting from actually 11 a.m. right after this, uh, we have introduction to services mesh going all the way down to uh, 4 p.m., which is uh, introduction to computer vision and building applications that can see for everyone who loves computer vision. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, I don't know if we have any questions from the audience or Twitch, but if we do, feel free to ask them away. Um, Otherwise, thanks, everyone. Kanal. Yes. We have a question from Twitch, from Joseph Ireland. If you're using Node.js code that depends on an NPM package with native code, can you run that as part of the Lambda? Sorry, can you read the question? OK. If you're using Node.js and you pull an NPM package in that includes native code, can you run that in the Lambda? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure exactly on that. I'm more of a Python dev myself. OK. Anybody in the audience have a question? OK, let me yes. run the mic over. Hi, uh, thanks for the demo. Um, what's the difference between LightSail and EC2 instance? So LightSail adds a bunch of abstractions onto EC2 instances to make it really easy to go ahead and spin up a virtual int machine. So you'll see it automatically adds IP addresses and just gives a better interface and all one-shot interface to get going with it. OK, we have another question from nice. Twitch. Robert Tables asks, how is Lambda serverless if it runs on servers? Great, great question. Um, so yes, there are servers in the background, but for us, it's serverless. We don't worry about the infrastructure. We just have code that we put up in the cloud. We don't have to allocate any machines, have to worry about anything for networking, how it handles the different software for serving any of the code that we want to serve. Um, we just push that code in the cloud, and we invoke it with a couple of different methods. Any other questions in the audience? Questions? Awesome. So cool. thanks, guys. Oh, yeah, one more question. Uh, so for the Lambda functions, do we have to use um, like the Node.js backend? Like, Sorry, I can hear you. Uh, do we have to use the Node.js backend, or do we have to use the backend that it gives us? No, no, you can use any language you want. Um, so in that last demo, when I showed with Chalice, it was actually using Python uh, backend for there, too. OK. Yeah. Great. You hear that, folks, and Twitch. Any language you want, uh, Lambda custom runtimes. And also, a really cool feature to check out is uh, Lambda layers. I know I see a lot of questions about asking about dependency management. Lambda layers, a new feature that we announced. Uh, you can manage dependencies that way. Uh, just Google for it. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>